you so much for this morning. I thank you that you have given us not only provision, but opportunity to be here. Lord, I pray for those who, um, Lord, who, who wanted to be here, who want to be in your presence, who want to be in this place, but because of circumstances or illness or, or many things, Lord, they are not here. I pray that your favor would fall upon them. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a, 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 an outline, an unction, a guidance by your Holy Spirit that we might be uh, deeply moved and forever changed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go ahead and take a Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I, I, I have a question for you this morning as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 2. It's a, a chapter we've seen a lot. You hear a lot of messages about. Um, I think it's very, very relevant for today. Um, in, in our world today, there's so many things and so many details and so many uh, times that we're bombarded. You know that we are the most information-driven society ever? We have so much information that I wonder sometimes if we get, we get a lot of volume, but we don't really get a lot of in-depth look at that volume. Um, I was thinking about this, and, and I was thinking about our world today and how detailed things and how unique things are and how certain things are named. You, you ever wonder about the names of things? Um, I, I wonder about the, the names of things a, a lot. Um, I, I want to tell you about something. If you get nothing else, maybe you take a pen and write down this, this name. Um, maybe you'll learn something about something you do probably at least once a day, if not twice a day, and you may not even know the name of it. It brushes your teeth. At least occasionally. And in the process of brushing your teeth, most of us take a toothbrush and we put that little, little wave of toothpaste on there. And it gets this nice little curly cue because that's what happens when the toothpaste just kind of spits it out there. You know what that's called? A nerbal. It actually has a name. The name nerbal is actually being copyrighted and it's fought about. It's been in a lawsuit for, it was in a lawsuit for a couple of years. I don't know exactly how that panned out, who got control of the word nerbal. But it reminds me that there are so many things, so many, so many day-to-day -day things that I may not pay attention to the details in. I was thinking about another one. Um, you, you may have uh, read about or heard about or remember Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. And uh, I kind of followed him, and even before he was captured, I followed how he, how he um, did things and, and how they were tracking him. And um, from his cabin in Lincoln, uh, Montana, they began to surround him and finally caught him. But do you know how the name Unabomber came about? Una universities, because that's one of the first places that the bombs went to. Una, A, airlines, one of the second places. The problem is, and when we listen to experts, sometimes this happens. They missed it. They should have named him something else. Because he also sent bombs to oil executives. He also sent, sent it to, and on behalf of, environmental groups. He signed all of the letters with the term FC. To, to, to point toward envir environmental issues. How weird, isn't it? Do you know that at one time there was 150 of the best, greatest minds of all over the world working on the Unabomber case? And they came up with the wrong name. How does that happen? Shouldn't we be in a position? Shouldn't we be in a place? Shouldn't we be people who, who can trust the words that we hear? Maybe. Maybe. Paul is kind of one of those who, who has an, kind of an intriguing and, and interesting look at his life. And, and sometimes the details are overlooked. He had many details that would, would help us understand exactly why he said or why he did the things he did. Even timing-wise. You, you ever wonder about not just a nerdle or about a Unabomber, but about timing? You see, a lot of us are wondering about timing now. Jobs are teetering on the brink if they're not already gone. Livelihoods are pushed into the background. The world seems turned upside down. And that's just about the coronavirus. I'm not even talking about the bombings and the shootings and the, the things that have happened that somehow got missed in all of our reporting. Our world really is turned upside down, and the details are really kind of interesting. See, Paul, when he wrote the book of Ephesians, he had an interesting human dilemma. Have you ever noticed that when you try to step out on behalf of God or in tune with God, 
Human dilemmas seem to pop up. They always do. He had an interesting human dilemma. He wanted to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. It was important for him to be there, to be supportive, and, and to be a, a participant in that particular Pentecost. The problem with that is he didn't have time to stop at Ephesus. He's going to go pretty close. He's going to sail right by there. But he had to get to Jerusalem. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like life is in such a, a big hurry? You're just trying to get to the destination. Can I help you with that this morning? Sometimes the destination is not what you think. Some, sometimes it's about the deliberate steps leading to the destination. And not necessarily the destination. Paul learns that. And he even talks about it a little bit in Acts chapter 21 verse 13. Where Paul tells those who are around him that he's afraid, that, not afraid, that he's uh, pretty confident that he's going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to kill him. <laughs> That's a great invitation, right? Great calling card, right? Definitely want to pay attention to the details there. But you know that that doesn't stop him from going. Doesn't stop him and change his mind. Doesn't deter him from the bad things that are happening. You know, you know it might be a good point of confirmation for us that sometimes difficult things happen in our world even to the good people. And sometimes the best thing that we can do is take that next step. Well, Wayne, I don't know what the next three steps are. I, I don't either a lot of times. But I know the next step's important. And after that, I'll worry about that second step. See, Paul also knew that he, would, he may never see those in Ephesus again. He's their spiritual father. Don't you think he wanted to stop by there? Don't you think he was concerned about how they might grow or how they might develop? And, and we think about the first century church as being some place that was great, glorious, harmonious. No, by this time, there's already been those who had brought in false teachings. There are already those dissensions and fights in the church. Well, we're not supposed to talk about the fights in the church, though, are we? I mean, that's not right. Those don't happen. Well, they happened back then. How about that? They happened back then. They don't happen now. In the midst of things, Paul's got great concerns. Can you imagine also that if he sailed right by and he went on into Jerusalem, how, the, how those at Ephesus would feel? Especially if they heard that he'd been killed? Why didn't he take just a moment for us? Why didn't he take just a, a, a brief moment and swing by for us? We needed him. You know, it's funny. We're not chosen by God. I hear that term a lot. We talk about being chosen by God. I don't think we're as much chosen by God as we are adopted. And with adoption, a whole different context of things happen. With adoption, we're not talking about whether we can come or go. Once you're in, you're in. Once you're family, you're family. Adoption is a completely different thing. Once you sign the papers, once you, once you adopt, once you are grafted in, as John would tell us, you're there. There's no pulling you away. There's no deterring you. There's no those washing you away. You're accepted. Once, once you're part of the family of God, you're also redeemed. God has sent his, his son to die for us, to redeem us, to put us, to put us not only in the family, but to get us out of the back door. Hovering, fearful. God wants you to come in, have a seat. We're also sealed. Well, how do I, how do I know that? What? What, what do you, how do you know that? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells me that I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. That I have wisdom and, and intellects and guidance and comfort and, and unctioning from that Holy Spirit that I will never have had had I not been his child. So I'm accepted, I'm redeemed, I'm sealed. And the last thing, we are secure in Christ. See, somebody needs to stand up and say we are secure in Christ today. Because you know what the world's telling you? The sky's falling. And it's horrible. And it's bad. And diff difficult things are everywhere. And don't get me wrong. There are lots of difficult things in our world today. But don't lose sight of the fact that we are secure in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And no matter what the world throws at us, and, and hear this, and no matter what your mind can try, you're secure. I'm glad about that. I don't know about you, but that, that gives me great comfort. And when I look at Paul, and especially here in the book of uh, uh, Ephesians, and he pours out this abundant hope and this great encouragement, I look at the guy a little different knowing where he's been. I look at the guy a little different knowing where he's going. 
He's not just some guy sitting in a cubicle somewhere writing a, a, a dissertation. He's a guy who's living life, giving his life, that others might be touched. See, if, we're, if, if we really are desperately in need of hope and encouragement in our lives today, we not only need to listen to Paul, but we need to adopt and act on what he says. Well, that's great, man. But what does he say? Well, glad you asked that too. Verse 1 begins to give us this kaleidoscope of color. When you were a child, did you ever have a kaleidoscope? You, you turn the little prism and different colors would fall in. You know, the, the funny thing is, um, you look at that and you think, man, that's great. And there's all these nice colors. Sometimes the colors are surprising. Some, sometimes the colors are shocking. Well, what do I mean by that? Look at verse 1. And you make me alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You're like, well, wait a minute, wait. I, you, you talked about hope. You talked about encouragement. I, I don't see it there. No, wait, 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 wait. Listen, he's saying that there's a dis different aspect to this kaleidoscope, that it paints a completely different picture, that, that things are different. Do you see it there? He talks about those who were first, those who were made alive. Why were they made alive? Because they were dead. You don't get made alive unless you're dead, right? You don't need to be made alive if you're not dead, right? It's the same premise of a seed falling to the ground. That seed had to virtually die first before it begins to permeate, before it begins to grow. He says you were once those who were dead, but in, even in your trespasses and sins. But now you've been made alive. And, and you were those who walked according to the course of this world, it says. You know what the course of this world is, right? It's when we do our stuff. We put God's stuff over there. Or we don't mess with it at all. And we walk according to our own stuff. We're walking according to the world's stuff. And you know, that some of the world's stuff might be fear. Might be doubt. Might be anxiety. It, it might be a lot of things. Do you know that we are the most medicated country in the world for anxiety? We need to know and understand that hope comes from from God Almighty and not from a prescription. Now, am I telling you that sometimes prescriptions don't help? No. Nope. Sometimes prescriptions help. But God is the author and giver of every medicine that is necessary. And he will take care of you. And in that, we need to do the things that help us walk away from the world and walk toward God. Well, what else did he say? He said also, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, this, this one we use a lot. Because <laughs> we use that term, and it, it's not a real popular term anymore, but we use that term, the devil made me do it. You know, we just, we kind of evaluate that and, and pour it out there. Well, the devil's causing this, or the devil's causing that, or the devil's doing this. Do you know that even in spite of what the devil's doing, and he is alive and well, no doubt. In spite of what he's doing, do you know that I still have a responsibility to do the right thing? To walk toward God? I can't use him as an excuse. I can't use you as an excuse. I want to. I tried. We talked about it, God and I. It don't work. Because I'm responsible to him. And Paul's telling them, you need to know and understand where you stand and why you stand there. He also says, among whom, verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of flesh. He says, we've all been there. And you're like, wait a minute, I haven't been there. Oh, really? I trust Paul, but we can go down a list. You perfect? Never missed the mark? Always done the correct thing for the right reason at the right time? I caught myself yesterday putting my socks on the wrong feet. You're like, what do you mean, these socks? I have socks that tell me left and right. Now, I'm not telling you I need those, but I do have some that tell me left and right. And I put my socks on the wrong feet. And I look down and I'm thinking, how many times have you done this before? This, I know it may seem like it, but it's not the first day I put on socks. 
I do it fairly often, sometimes multiple times a day. And I still got it wrong. Do you know why I got it wrong? Because it is in our nature to do it wrong. It is in our nature to do it selfish. It is in our nature to do it the opposite way of what God would call us to do. We need God in our life, not because we are banished from society or banished from uh, his presence, but we need him because we can't get it right. And the only way to live in love, pure love, unmanipulated love, is to know God Almighty and to understand his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. See, in this somewhere, we also, what else does it say? We, we follow the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath. Just as the others. You know what he's alluding to? Paul's alluding to the fact that in, in Adam, in the Garden of Eden, when they took that apple, it was not just a taking of an apple or eating a fruit. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a day to cleanse yourself of all the impurities that, that other foods would give you. They made a choice, and in that choice, it brought in sin, and it brought in death. And because of the first Adam, every man, woman, child after that was responsible. And we needed one man, fully God, fully human, to come and walk to a cross to take care of us. See, this kaleidoscope paints this, this colors, and some of them look like and, and really look like the, this depravity of all and how bad things are and how difficult we are. But if you look at the flip side of that and you look at the colors and let them permeate through the sunlight of Jesus Christ, we begin to see that not only is it bright and shiny, but there are beautiful, beautiful lives built in Jesus Christ on his hope and on his encouragement. And see, if somebody's telling you that that's not true, they're lying to you. And they're leading you astray. God sent his messenger to tell those at Ephesus, there is a kaleidoscope of color. And it's not just about the depravity of all. It's about the beauty of Jesus Christ shining through. So what's the next thing? And, and, and this is these kaleidoscope of colors uh, paint an incredible picture, but, but they, also, they also show that the, there's, there's a context for what happens. There's a, there's a reason for things that, that happen. You ever wonder about that? Or is it just me? I always wonder why, why does that happen? Why, why do I act that way? Why do other people act that way? I, I, I'm like, I'm always lying. Now, admittedly, I'm pretty sure that God gets tired of me saying why. Why? 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 I can't even inflect enough to cover all the different ways I've asked why. But God says this. He said that in, in his mercy, in his gifting, in his calling to us, the why can easily be seen. Verse 4, there's a reason for his kindness, for his love, for who he is. There's a reason for the things that he does. He's not just randomly picking or choosing who he'll be nice to or who he'll be mean to. It doesn't work that way. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even we, even when we, we're dead in trespasses. Made us all together. I can't even read. How about I start over? That's what happens when you're reading two things at once. I don't know if you've ever tried that. It's not very good. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Let's just stop there for a moment. Because of God's loving us, the reason for Christ's kindness wasn't to get you to act a particular way. It wasn't to get you in a particular position. It wasn't... It wasn't to be the cosmic killjoy that takes away those things that you want or desire or hope or dream for. None of those were his agenda. His agenda was he loved us and his rich mercy compelled him to love us more. Now you, you're really thinking, now wait a minute, I need to do stuff, right? Or get cleaned up or, or get things right and then God will love me more. Nope. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. He loves you more than you can ever imagine to the depths of everything you can envision already. There ain't anything I can do to add to that. It's driven by what's the motor that, that drives the engine behind his love, mercy. 
tenderness, caring. Hard to believe somebody could care that much for us, isn't it? Especially after the last week we just had. The way we acted. Whew. Man. So we've got this reason for his kindness. We also have this rationale of his kindness. Verse 5. Even when we were dreaded, dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Well, let's look at a couple of things that he does here. What's, what's the rationale for his kindness? I love it when, when Paul writes because I don't know if you've ever noticed, but Paul kind of Paul, Paul kind of writes in a circle. He, he says what he's going to say and then he says it again. And he kind of writes back through it. Look at verse uh, 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together. The reason that Christ is doing what he does, what's his rationale? He wants to make us alive. He knows that we are dead, dead to him, dead to Christ, dead, dead to life, dead to sins. And he wants us to be alive. What's next? He made us alive. Then it, in verse uh, 6, and raised us up together. See, this contradicts what the devil would tell you. The devil tells you God wants to take away everything that you like. Everything you adore, everything that you want, all those selfish things. God just wants to take care of them. Well, that's not true. This says that God wants to raise us up together. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. And he wants to make sure that the desires of your heart are beneficial. Because you would, you, you would never act as an adult or even as a child the way some children act, would you? You know that kid that, that, that at Halloween eats so much candy that they get sick? You're not one of those people that one half gallon of ice cream is just not enough. You gotta have six. Okay, five. Then have the other kind you want. See what we do is we get to be we get to be overzealous. We get to be gluttons far, and and God knows that we need to be lifted up, raised up together, and He wants to take us from those things that are a detriment that harm us. Now wait a minute, when you're saying ice cream harms us, no, 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 no. Don't misquote me. I am a fan of ice cream. But moderation tells me that too much ice cream is bad for me. God wants to lift us up. He made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He took us from the world, walking as those who are consumed with themselves and the, the flesh of this earth, and he put us in a place of heavenly places. like getting carte blanche to some place you didn't really deserve to be. And you're not having to sneak. Nobody's going to kick you out. Because God will tell them that's one of mine. They get access to everything. You know that's what happened when the veil was torn and Christ died. Before that, the holiest of holies was only where the priests went. The priests could go in there, and of course they had to tie a rope to their legs just in case things went wrong. They had to drag them out because they were not clean. But the veil was torn so you and I might have access to God. Unabridged access to the heavenly places. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show his... What? Exceeding riches in his grace and his kindness toward us, toward me. It, it's, as though, it's as though he's saying that his rationale is that when he looks at me, he wouldn't look at me and, dis, and be disjointed, be disgruntled, be saddened. He would look at me and see the best in me. You know, I hope and dream for that every day. One of the best gifts he's ever given me is, is that feeling that I can come to him, that knowledge, that wisdom, that understanding that I can come to him and he doesn't look at me in a lesser light because of the silly things I did yesterday. 
or the insecurities that I act upon or the struggles that I have in life. He looks at me and sees me as glorious, favored, loved. His rationale is so different. So different than ours, so different than the world's, so different than what most people are promoting or telling you. He's so different. So we have this kindness and compassion, and we have the dependency of it all. You know, we had that depravity of it all in the first part, and now we have this dependency of it all. Do you know that you can't be that person who is seen favorably? You can't be that person who is seen productively? You, you can't be seen as that, we well, just can't be seen that way without Christ. Doesn't work that way. I am, you are, we all are completely dependent on Jesus Christ. I need his Holy Spirit to give me wisdom. I need his guidance and his favor. I need his word to give me insights and, and kindness. I need him every moment of every day. Can you imagine if the if the faucet ran out? If the availability ran out? There's no more compassion, no more love, no more mercy, no more grace, no more tenderness from, from God on our earth, in our lives. Can you imagine? See, verse 8 tells us that he is the king of compassion. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, see, we see that this, this king, the, the, the king who, who gave a glorious gift, what did, what did he give? He gave unmerited favor. He gave the blessing of us having a place in his kingdom. He gave the blessed gift of his son on the cross. You know, we talk about that a lot, but do you realize that if, if, if there hadn't been a blameless, spotless offering, I would still owe the price. I still have to pay the ticket. And so would you. And not only did he have to step in, and I've always kind of looked at it, you know, that, that, that God knew that he had to send his son. He just had to. But, but verses like this where Paul writes or, or many verses in the Bible tell me that God didn't just have to, he wanted to. He wanted to go to the cross for me. He wanted to step in the gap for you. He wanted to step in between you and, and the destruction that Satan tries to pour into your life. He wanted to be there. So he gave this gracious gift. But he's also the king who gave and granted giftings. Do you see it there, verse 9? Not of works, lest anyone should boast. What are we talking about? Not of. Not our salvation. Not the grace. Not the, the abundance that God gave us. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God. God granted a gifting. He, this, is, this will sound kind of strange, but you ever wonder what God was thinking about on the cross? Really? It's only me? I wonder about words. I wonder about thoughts. I, you know, he was thinking about you. And, and, and I want to I I kind of clarify this for you. He wasn't just thinking, oh, I'm covering this for them. Or, I'm taking care of this. or I'm, I'm abolishing this. He was thinking about the giftings. He was thinking about all the ways that he was going to pour himself into you. All the ways he was going to make your life better. Do you know that God has seen this film from beginning to end? There's nothing new. No surprise ending. No alternate ending. He knew. He knew on the cross. And he had hour upon hour to contemplate it. Against the backdrop of pain. Spitting. Ridicule. I think that's what the definition of grace is. I know we don't 
observe it, but I think in the back of his mind, in the back of his heart, he was smiling. He was lovingly smiling about us. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that wild? See, I need to know that God loves me in spite of all the viruses of the world. In spite of all the cancers of the world. In spite of jobs that come and go. In spite of people who either pat you on the back or attack you. All those things don't matter. What matters is I, I know that God's in my corner. I know that he's there for me. I read a story this week about a 24-year-old child who, um, you look at him, he looks normal, everything's fine, you know. But he, he gets on a plane, and, on a plane, on a train, and they're going down the road, and, and uh, he's kind of bouncing in the seat. You ever been around those? They're just a little hyper. And uh, he's kind of bouncing in the seat, and his mom and dad are there, and an elderly couple are sitting across the, the aisle way, and then there's a, a, a younger person sitting on the right. And he's kind of bouncing apart, uh, and he turns and looks at his dad, and he goes, Look, Dad, look, the trees are going behind us. And then the, the lady who's sitting across from him says, You know, you, you really should take your son to the doctor. He's, he's awful rambunctious. And about the time he jumps off and runs over the other side of the car, and he, he looks up and he goes, But Dad, the clouds are following us. And this time she couldn't take it. She said, You, you really need to take him to a good doctor. This, this is horrible. And he smiles, and he, the dad smiles and says, Yeah, we're just coming from the doctor. Great hospital. He just got his eyes. Couldn't see before. See, we get to thinking, well, this is the way things are. No, it's not. God's seeking to give you your eye that you might see things in a spiritual way. That you might not be um, having cataracts from the world attacking you and pouring bad things and evil things on you that diminish and distort your vision. He wants you to see clearly. He wants to write such a story in you that it will bring awe and excitement not only to you, but pleasure to the Father. So how do we do that? Paul, I think, is telling the people in Ephesus, God's offering hope, God's offering encouragement. Let him write your story. I may not make it. I may not come. I may not make it out of Jerusalem. Let him write your story. You made it to church this morning, great. There's no gifts or guarantees of tomorrow. Let God write your story. Maybe you didn't make it to church this morning and you're struggling. You need to look not only into, this, into the, the camera that's showing you this, uh, this message, but you need to realize God has hope for you. God is there for you. And he will make sure that you are taken care of. Let him write your story. He's the greatest author of all. You'll never be disappointed. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would show us how to be your children. How to respond to your touch. How to listen to your unction and your guidance. Lord, I pray that you would begin today to to rewrite all the wrongs that we have walked in. Lord, if there are those who are here today or those who are listening, if they have never made a commitment to you, Lord, I pray it's today. I pray, Lord, that they would see in such a way that there is this great chasm between them and what you desire for them, who you are and how your love is, that that grace might abound in them. And, Lord, I pray that your grace might, might pour out on all of us in such a way that we don't look at the baggage anymore. We don't look at the first chapters of our life. But we look at today and the rewriting that you are doing. And we look to tomorrow and the way that you're going to write a glorious ending to a great and glorious relationship. I thank you, Lord. I praise you for the hope that you give. And I look forward to how you walk us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you all. Have a great day.